forever to set up, get started today. It's all right. Yeah. It's all right. Well, we got EK now, so we're able to get the... Uh, EK in the house. Uh, we're able to get the video content just perfect. He, he doesn't like putting the name FXBG Public Radio on something unless it's perfect. Oh, you know, I respect get, that. You, you can respect that kind of professional professional I, uh, perfection. I like that, too. I want it to look right. I don't want it to look half-assed. Absolutely. I want it to look like we're supposed to be here. I want. I take myself seriously, so I want people to take take us seriously. Absolutely. Sincerely, I, sh- I should say. You, uh, you remember the poem? Are you ready to get started? Whether right or left or right or wrong, our voices make a song. For in the end, we are friends. And your, your opinion, opinion, I'll defend. I'll defend. I'll defend. No, I'll defend your opinion more. All right. Well, we gave the parental advisory warning and stuff like that. Fuck, kind of... fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> I make it a point. It's not a reason to celebrate, all right? <laughs> <laughs> what was that, old school? Old school, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I like this new setup. Well, not, well, I'm too ugly to be this too close, close up. Too, yeah, too, too close much to of a me. close up. Yeah, you can't back the chair up. I'm I'm trying to get centered just right. I'm too ugly. What if you back the chair up? I'm fine right now. I think this is good. This is good. It's going to get all right. Yeah, well, I have like eons worth of acne scars from sleepless nights from psychedelic yeah, abuse. Yeah, I wanted to and, ask you, and, did you like pop a lot of pimples? Yeah, I used to use like rubbing alcohol or something like that. I don't know. Leave me alone. No, seriously, I'm I'm curious. It's like because you see people like with Edward James Olmos. Uh huh. You know, it's like what happened? Tell me how the acne thing worked out. Because I mean, all teenagers go through the acne thing. Popped a lot of pimples. See, I never did that. Don't don't pop them, man. Soap and water. That's all you need. Soap and water. Mm -hmm. Well, don't pop your pimples, kid. Otherwise, you'll be ugly like me and Edward James Olmos. Edward James Olmos is rich as shit. Yeah, I hope that I can. (laughs) uh, He and he's a great teacher too. Just what? Absolutely. Teaches math. I think so. To kids and underprivileged children in the inner city. Mm -hmm. So that's good, and we we thank him for that. I cannot, for the life of me, remember the name of that movie. I can't remember the name of it either, but I remember Uh, watching it. Stand and deliver. Stand and deliver. I knew it was Stan something. I was going to say Stand By Me, but I knew that wasn't right. I've watched so many movies. Welcome to Scott vs. Scott, everybody. Scott vs. Scott, where we discuss three topics, or as we call them, Scopics. No. (laughs) That's not what we call it. Hashtag Scott. Scott. I can't even say it. Scopics. Scott pick. So what would you define the first topic, Scopic, as Scott? Scopic? Yeah, what would you define uh, well, it as? Well, we have three categories. We like to talk about yes. three different uh, uh, three different sections of our show. And that's like the first one we want to do like a uh, uh, political and or topical or current events kind of uh, issue. Right. Something or, kind of big picture like yeah, that. Yeah, kind of like that. The and second. The sepic. The, the, the sepic? The, the second. second to- the scopic. second topic. <laughs> I can't get past. You laugh like a wild turkey, man. You I'm know sorry. that? It smells like a wild turkey over here. It's weird. It took a while to set up. Everybody. The second uh, topic category that we like to go for is something like a little more lighthearted. So as you saw in the past weeks, I think we did music on the first episode. We've done kind of the history of fights and fighting with our own past and our own. Oh, and, yeah. You know, I like to watch UFC and boxing and stuff like that. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, what else have we talked about? We talked about tattoos. Yeah. But the idea of that second topic is to keep things light, something accessible to everybody, because right. uh, one of my faults is I get too cerebral on everything. <laughs> and if you've ever seen my show on Shock Monkey Radio, it's just, I'm all, it's all up in my head. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> it's a thinker, this one. Yeah. I think too much. Yeah. Uh, you know that kid in, what was that, uh, Road Trip? That kid in Road Trip, uh, the story of the kid is like, he's talking to the old man and says, you know, I've always in, been in my head. I think too much. People have been telling me, you know, I'm not. I'm too much brains, not enough cock and balls. That's me. Subtract weed, and that's me. Subtract weed, and that's you. <laughs> I overthink things, too, but when I get locked into this situation or there's an audience, I definitely am, like, a very no-filter, just I kind of say the things that come to my mouth. Well, Every I mean, once in a while, I'll take a step back and be mindful. It's usually in those moments that I find that I have the more intelligent things to say or the more witty things to say. So. Yeah, well, I mean... I think when we originally started it, we wanted the second topic to be uh, somewhat like a cooling off period. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like because the topics at the ends are going to be more heated and it's going to have, so we have this like cooling off right. period. 
And so we have the, the second segment is kind of a lighter topic. Right, right. That is more accessible. It's bookended by those heavier topics. The heavier topics, like the first ones are t- uh, topical or current events kind of topic. And the third one, which is religion and spirituality. Yeah, or, f- or philosophy. Or philosophy. I think we talked about that too. Yeah, absolutely. Consciousness. Because I think of, that's all kind of related. Yeah, things in that, that realm. Absolutely. So <clears throat> what are we going to talk about today? You want to tell them about all the topics right off the top? or All the topics off the top are, okay. so we're talking about compulsory government service, Correct. which is a topic like, that you came to me with. Like the draft? Yes. And yes. Our like, second topic. Like the draft. Mm-hmm. Our second topic that we're going to be talking about is the benefit uh, and use. If or, any. Or, yes. If the, any. Yes. If any. Of psychedelics. Um, of psychedelics, yes. We're going to talk about psychedelic usages and the pros and cons, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> or the pros and cons, how we see them. Anyway, the third, our third topic, topic that we're going to talk about is Islam, um, the Muslim faith, and things surrounding that. Absolutely. So stay tuned for that. Yes. Yes. All righty. So you want to start off with something about the selective service of the draft? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't totally agree with selective service and the draft. I mean, we see how we see how that worked before in the '60s. We've talked about the entire culture uh, dedicated a lot of good songs, a uh, <laughs> lot of great songs. Yeah, man. a lot you of know. draft Dodgers writing songs. A lot of draft Dodgers. I mean, Muhammad Ali. Uh, Donald Trump. Well, Muhammad uh, Ali, Muslim and conscientious objector, right? Just to tie right. It all in together, and that's and that's where that's a big part of the reason why I disagree with selective service and the draft, and and if we're talking compulsory government service in the sense of Israel, you know what I mean? That same kind of uh, or South Korea, those countries that have like uh, everyone must serve. That, right, and that's what right. we're talking about. Right, right, right. So Everyone has to serve in the military or uh, some other industry. Right, right. So if we're talking about it in those terms, I don't, I'm going to have to say I don't agree with it, um, especially myself being someone who's, I don't 100% agree with, uh, you know, war and violence. Um, I am a, a bit of a conscientious, conscientious objector. I uh, have morals and things like that. And I know that there's a lot of people like that and also people whose religions, you know, like you said, Muhammad Ali being a Muslim, that their religion, their ideology doesn't align with uh, war. Well, uh, same with the Amish, you know. Right, 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 right. And so, because um, a lot of, you know, conscientious objection, you know, it was a big thing in the 60s. And I understand that. And it's like, there, there is some, uh, if you don't want to be the kind of person who is involved in warfare, I really do understand that, especially because I served in the Navy. Right. You know, and I do think that my service in the Navy has made me a better person, a better member of society than I probably would have been otherwise. And so I think the value of serving, you know, the, in the Navy, even if it was a war fighter role, you know, I think that has great benefits on people who come back to the civilian population. Right. All right. You got, you're talking about all these veterans who are coming back from war in Iraq and Afghanistan and stuff like that. And it's like they're bringing home a whole, bunch, a whole bevy of knowledge that is very useful when it ta- comes to defending your homeland, defending your family, and defending uh, your community. You know? And so I think it's good that a lot of people have these services and have this patriotic notion and understand why the, uh, the government is the way it is, how the government works the way it works, and how you know, um, all these services are done. Now, if I had been somebody who was a conscientious objector, you know, it's like, I don't feel like I could be involved in warfare. There are plenty of, like, um, non-warfare type roles in the military. You know, I mean, you, um, to the point where it's like, you never fire a weapon. Right. You know, you could be just a logistics officer. But how much of that is your choice when it comes down to being in a, 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 well, a compulsory it, government service like that in the way that we're talking about, like, South Korea or or Israel, you know what I mean? How much, I'm sure there is a little bit of like, okay, we're going to try to, you know, go gear, be geared towards your preference or your strengths, but shit, not everybody can be a chef, you know? Not- Absolutely. And, and I think that would, cause I mean, obviously, you know, people with schizophrenia cannot join the military. Right. And, and, uh, I think there's a very good reason why you don't want people like right. that in the military. And so, um, right. And, and in other countries where there's people with certain disabilities or reasons why they can't join the military where they have these compulsory government services like uh, Switzerland, they, uh, from what I saw earlier, read earlier, they charge like a 30% uh, income tax on these people up until a certain age. So they, so it's well, okay. If you don't agree with this government service, then okay, pay, pay the tax. And it's, it's up to 20 and 
uh, tax. You, do you think that's a good idea, though? No, I don't think that's a good idea. I think that this kind of being forced upon... All right, I, so first of all, Scott, I agree with a lot of what you're saying about the the benefits of joining the military. And, and we've talked about this before when we were talking about, you know, teamwork, camaraderie, brotherhood, when we talked about sports on, on the first episode. Oh, yeah. So there is totally that aspect of, you know, uh, uh, discipline, you know, uh, all the skills that you can learn from the military. I, I do wish that I had, you know... Uh, military level survival skills you know uh wh why wouldn't you want to know that to go camping or go you know be able to live in the fucking woods like a like a navy seal or something that those would be great skills to learn sure um and, and uh sure there's all those benefits there are many benefits that that help people you know a lot of people who grew up fuck ups um for lack of a better term have you know the military has turned their life around in the same way Absolutely. that religion helps some people, you know what I mean? Sure. So I'm not going to sit here and totally discredit, you know, Christianity or, or the army or the Marines, um, because there is some good that comes out of it for sure, but it's not for everyone. And you can't put a square block into a round hole, uh, you know, sure. uh, not, you know, at least up until a certain point now. But that's what I mean. It's like, um, I, I had a friend who wanted to join the Navy and, um, he wasn't born in this country, right? And so his language skills, having not grown up in um, the United States his whole life, his language skills weren't as strong as mine, and he didn't make the cutoff. You know, I mean, in the language section of the ASVAB, he, was, uh, he just couldn't make it. And so we have a cutoff for these different services. You know, like, for example, it, it's easier for you to get into the Army or Marine Corps than it is for you to get into the Navy or Air Force. You know, there's a different set of standards right. when it comes. And so for each of those operations, you have different sets of standards for people. And even, even when you're talking about the population that could qualify to be drafted in some military, military service, you're talking maybe about a third of the population, a third of our, the United States population that could meet the standards to serve in the U.S. military. Right. So you cannot say, like, selective service for everybody is a good thing because that, that's it just, just assuming you can only go in the military. However, there are peacetime things or even domestic things that could be done. We can get a bunch of people together and take a, like a, who do, do their service and do things like repair our infrastructure, like places like Flint, Michigan, right. where people still need to get clean water. You know, and we can also do like hospice. Hospice cares for the, uh, the, the baby boom population who is getting into right. that age group. You know, we could do a lot of good things for society and our fellow Americans if everyone is compuls has a compulsory service of, say, like a year or two. You know, in service, and doesn't necessarily have to be in the military. If you want to go military, if you qualify for the military, go military. Otherwise, you know, you have these other domestic services that you can do that will help make America better. Like, not even just hospice care, just even medical assistance. Well, I think, like, uh, Canada has the candy stri stripers, where you have teenagers, right. like, coming around just doing orderly type work. Right. You know? Can you say that you have can be a conscientious objector of working in a hospital for a couple of years? Right, right, this, right. For the, and once for again, that's one of those things that's not for everyone. But the the options in this scenario aren't just military, you or know, war, military yeah. or or healthcare. You know, there are other social services that people could help with. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, help with the food bank, uh, with things our, like that. Our, oh. our our failing infrastructure in this country. Right, right. Yeah, we'll go work for VDOT for <laughs> you know, but uh, and I, so. When we're talking about it in those terms, I do, I do like that idea to a certain extent. I do, I do believe it's beneficial to the community, absolutely, um, as a whole. You know, what I mean, because because it, um, it, it's us giving back to the community, everyone giving back to the community. Um, when you think about it on that big scale, as, as far as society, but as far as individual goes, I think that helps us too to have a better understanding of each other, um, which is kind of what this podcast is about. Absolutely. Um, and have a better appreciation and respect for our fellow man and and the community um, that we're in, um, and and this could be something that's on a global scale too. You know what I mean? It, who's to say that some of these social services are, you know, if, if if it's selective service that sends you to the military to go to fight in war in foreign countries, there's no reason you can't join a, a peace corps or something like that, a Absolutely. red a red cross or the red cross, exactly. Um, so there there are tons of different options that. The the part where it just starts getting fuzzy and weird for me, I'm going to play devil's advocate with myself because, like I said, I, I do agree with it when it comes down to those terms. It's just that I do think that when you're forcing something on somebody, it causes resentment um, and 
uh, particularly when the government starts forcing and mandating things on us. I know a lot of people in this country already have a certain distrust uh, for the government. And something like that, I think, will only propel that distrust for uh, a, a large portion or a moderate portion percentage of uh, the society that we live in. So with, with uh, sure. an, an, another thing, too, um, when we're talking about it in terms of just war, so um, what was that term that you kept using earlier for the... Like what? What kind of? What? What are the soldiers called? The type of soldier that they're called? Conscripts. Conscript soldiers. Okay. So yeah, you and um. So that that kind of decreases morale, right? On Absolutely. both ends, someone being forced to be in a situation that they don't want to be in, and yeah. then the people who are voluntarily being there and want to, you know, they, they they believe that they're there fighting a greater good when they get paired with a conscientious objector, you know, who got that, who got dragged kicking and screaming into service. Right. Yeah. That that causes a lot of friction, and that's not conducive to a a platoon, a team, a, a unit, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, things get shaky there, and I think that that concept could still apply to people that are being put into some service that they don't, they don't want to do. Right. And, and yes, it helps by expanding the options that we're giving you. So you get more of a choice like, okay, I want to go work with the national parks. And since that's something that you want to do for your six months, mandatory compulsory service, then um, it makes it more enjoyable. You know what I mean? Sure. And, and and decreases that. Plus, it's all, you know, for some people that d don't have all the opportunities or maybe the way they perceive life, at least, is that they weren't given all the opportunities. You know what I mean? Now you have the opportunity to go work for the park service or whatever thing it is that's a option for the potential compulsory service that you're being enrolled in. And now you get to go learn those skills, build that resume, and and possibly stay on with them longer than the six months or absolutely you know find that you like it right fine yes exactly so um and that would that that wouldn't be a bad career track if you're just right. kind of the person who wants to walk around national parks all your life oh yeah wouldn't that be awesome <laughs> so i think i think there is some compromise here you know what i mean um I'm sure i and i agree with your point that you know anything mandatory made mandatory by a government is made mandatory at the point of a gun you know? Right, right, right. And I think that's going to breed resentment no matter what. Right. Okay, so in, in um, uh, so as an alternative or a compromise to this, uh, have you ever seen a movie called Starship Troopers? No, I've never seen Starship Troopers. Okay. Well, they have these two classes of citizens. You know, they had citizens and civilians, all right? And civilians, uh, civilians were, they didn't have to go to war. They, you know, they weren't military. They're true civilians. However, they didn't have the rights that citizens have. Citizens who give government service, they have like they're they're more likely to get a license to have children. They're more likely to uh, uh, get a um, uh, political office. You have to get a you know you have to be right, a citizen right, to right, run right. for political office and so forth. Right. And so I think that that's kind of an interesting. I know there's people out there who read the book and say, like, oh, it's way way more complicated than that. It's like I don't care. I'm just talking about Starship Troopers, broad strokes. Right. All right. Where there's two classes of of, of citizenry where one is a citizen and one is a civilian, and the citizen has more rights than a civilian. Do you think that's better? Oh, man, that sounds real dystopian. It is dystopian. But welcome to the dystopia. It's 2021, bitch. Yeah, I guess Time that's my problem up. is I keep trying to make a utopia, and it's, just, it's, it's almost seemingly impossible it at is, times. It is impossible. Especially in this, uh, wanna... this era that we live in of social media and de political division and everything is so fucking politicized. And you want a supervillain thought in your head? You want peace on earth? Thanos wasn't all the way wrong. Let me That's just say right. that. That's right. The um, the one, but why couldn't he make the universe twice as big? The um, oh, dude. <laughs> anyway, I forgot my point. So, are we on the same page in terms of selective service? It's like it, it shouldn't necessarily be the military. And what about women? You think women should be uh, signing up for selective service? Um, I think they should be compulsed, compelled, compelled by the, by the government. Yeah, sure. Service, sure, totally. But like, like there already is with the selective service. There's definitely some rules and guidelines in place to make sure that you know people can carry on 
family names and, and things of that nature, you know what Absolutely. I mean? And not everybody is eligible. Um, and then once again, if it's selective service in the terms that we're talking about them in, when given these options and, and a broader spectrum of things to uh, be enrolled in, it makes, yeah, totally. Uh, women might, women probably are, I, I, I haven't done the research, I don't have the notes or any statistics for you, but I feel like women being more compassionate creatures that they are probably fare better if, in these uh, nurse type roles. Well, yeah, and social services you and things sexist. of those nature. <laughs> it's not sexist. It's true. It is. They're true. more compassionate, caring beings, and and have a yeah. Women tend to be more nurturing. Yeah. Um. So when it comes to things as like social services or working in healthcare, hospice, things like that that you named, um, I think w women would have the advantage. Absolutely. In, in those, I am very cold and uh, terse. Right. You know, and so I would never be able to make it in the medical career, right? Medical right. field. At all, because I have uh, I'm off putting to people. Right. The way I talk, the way <laughs> the way I matter of fact and so forth, I'm off putting. You know, and you have to be somewhat gregarious or you know outgoing and open. And I don't have that in me to do that job. And so, right. by all means, if you have a natural affiliation, it doesn't matter what your gender is. You sexist bastard. You know, it doesn't matter what your gender is. But so maybe no, you you're can, totally right. It you doesn't matter what to, your gender yeah, is. It can you can gravitate to something that's better for you. You know, an isolationist kind of mind like myself, they would fare better in the military than they would in a medical kind of role. Right. And so I could be the guy who chooses uh, right. Navy service or something. Yeah, and I, I mean, yeah, I'm I'm definitely generalizing. That's not all women, but I think that most of us can agree that women have a maternal nature for some weird reason. Um, I don't know what it is about them that makes them have a maternal and nurturing nature, and those traits just a cross over and apply better to the fields that we previously discussed. The other, the, the other thing with this, though, that we're talking about, so yeah, well, okay, we're talking about it in these terms, this broader spectrum, there's still going to be, you know, not everybody can be a park ranger, not everybody can be a, a candy striper, but, you know what yeah. I mean? There, there's still going to be people that have, hey, we, we do still need people to be, you know, artillery. Sure. So, um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, you're forcing somebody at the t end of a gun. There's, we're not, there, there's no getting right, around that. Right. Um, but what I mean, and that's is where that, it gets real weird. Yeah. When, um, when I took, when you take, when you go into the military, you take a test called, called the ASVAB, right. And you get a score and based upon this score, it lets you know what kind of jobs or ratings or MOSs you can get depending upon the branch mm -hmm. you're in. And the higher your score, the more options you have in terms of the job you can do. Right, yeah. And so if you have a low score on the ASVAB, you probably have like a choice between infantry, deck seamen, something like that, right. you know. Um, but, uh, and I think that it, in an ASVAB or some similar type of test among people who are turning 18, you know, you got to take this test for the government and the government will say, well, we find that your aptitude is more likely to be conducive to these particular jobs. And of course, that could be influenced like the military's is, is like their current need, you know, and based as best fit for their uh, for right. the personality type or intellectual level, right. or physical, you know, level. Right. So it's kind of yeah. I see. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah, because if you're like we're saying, offering in this broader spectrum, then yeah, it's it goes by need and fit. You know what I mean? So there's a little bit of a uh, to each according. It is, it is tailored a little bit to each according to his need. No, to each according to his ability, to each according to his need. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can't or, believe that just came out of my mouth. Or I don't believe that. I think the government should be out of our lives at all, 100%. It's like, I, no, you can't make me do anything. Yeah, the, the little government, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, the government that governs least is the government that governs best. best. So yeah. I believe that was Thoreau that said that. Well, you know, who knows? You're, you're quoting Thoreau. I'm quoting, uh, what's his name? Marks. That's the one. <laughs> What's his name? That asshole, Marks. Yep. I heard that. All right, so comment below and tell us who won. Yeah, let us know. Who do you think won that one? Also, subscribe. Tell like, all share, your friends subscribe. about us. Yeah, tell us all about us. All right, you want to talk about the values, if any, of psychedelics? Um. Yeah, I guess I should kick this one off too, Scott. Uh, what do you think? I, I kind of kicked off the last. Usually, you kick off things, man. Now I'm look at me running the show. That's fine with today. me. Today, can I ask you uh, one question before we get started? Do you think marijuana is a psychedelic? Do I think marijuana is a psychedelic? I think I know that marijuana has some psychedelic properties. 
it is about uh, the quantity or the way in which it's ingested. Um, so if, if you eat a bunch of fucking marijuana gummies, edibles, you're going to trip a little bit. Uh, you're you're, you're going to have a little bit of a psychedelic experience. Okay. Um, so it if, means if, like if, you, you got to take a lot. So technically it is, but it, like you need a lot. Right. Okay. Right. All right, but you can start it off. You can talk about psychedelics in any order you, you wish. Um, I mean, I think you know. I, I'm sure you came to me with this because you know, like I, I love psychedelics. I'm definitely a huge proponent of psychedelics. I was looking over your social media and I kind of picked up a theme. Yeah, there's a little bit of a theme there. Um, it's definitely it's one of my favorite things about this this meat prison realm that we're in is the use of psychedelics. They're kind of like a spiritual cheat code. I think they're fun. Um, <laughs> That's the thing, though, about psychedelics. It just, you know, it t- I've always heard it put like it. It sends the elevator all the way up to that top floor, and then, but you never really get to walk out. Did you just quote Joe Rogan? Rogan or Duncan Trussell or someone of that fucking nature. One um, of them, yeah. I heard Ram Dass kind of say something to a similar vein about it the other day on this uh, Ram Dass going home Netflix thing I watched, which is the official sponsor of Scott v. Scott. <clears throat> So just make sure you tweet Netflix and let them know because they don't know. So, um, yeah, there, there, there is definitely um, positive takeaways from psychedelic experiences. They 100% can cause you to look within in a, a way that you don't normally do and look without in a way that you don't normally do and, and alter your perception of this reality um and a change of perception is is never a bad thing you know um shit you can change your perception without psychedelics Absolutely. just t- turn the phone upside down and watch this podcast upside down and, and focus on our i used to watch tv you know, on the couch with my head hanging down yeah and i was just like wow this show is so different yeah it it's looks upside down yeah um absolutely and i think that that's uh that's a good thing it's like it's something i've always it's even mm-hmm. like in um uh dead poet society Mm-hmm. Oh, cat, my cat. And the whole idea of like standing up on the desk was like, change your perspective, right? You know, change your perspective and do that a lot. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's good advice. And you don't necessarily need psychedelics to experience that. No, you don't. You absolutely you do not. But they are, they are just they, one of many thing ways to change the way you perceive right. things. And they I, can be used as a tool. Sure. And, but I think that anyone who has any true intellectual curiosity has curiosity about psychedelics. Right. Okay. And so I think that, um, well, that's because anybody with true intellectual curiosity has curiosity about consciousness, consciousness about everything is like, uh, sure. And I, that's yeah. the birth of religion. That's a birth mm-hmm. of philosophy mm-hmm. in uh, human existence is that even long before we had language and stuff like that, people felt that there was more to us than our, you know, crude right here, you know? Right. <laughs> and so it's, um, yeah, it's, I think anyone who has any kind of intelligence, you know, probably got there because they're curious about the world in general, curious about reality, curious about how things work. And if you're somebody, if you're like a chemist, like I was watching Breaking Bad again recently, and it's like, if you're somebody like a chemist, it's like, you don't get that smart about chemistry without having a true interest in the the nature of the way that things work with, work with each other. And you have to have these questions about the way, the way something like uh, crystal meth affects people or the way that, you know, psychedelics like uh, lysergic acid right. uh, affects people. The psilocybin, you know, even, um, what's that in marijuana, um, tetrahydrocarbon cannabinol. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I, I, I believe wholeheartedly that psychedelics, LSD, you know, psychedelic mushroom psilocybin, um, dimethyltryptamine, DMT, DMT yeah. um, and, and a few others that I'm, you're just not thinking of right now. I'm sure Salvia has some Pe- strange... Peyote. Peyote, yep. Um, so there's definitely... Ayahuasca. Yeah, ayahuasca, yep. So there's there's totally um, positive things to take away from these. Um, they can be tremendous tools. But like a hammer, um, you know, once you start running around with it and swinging it, everything starts looking like a nail. Sure. Um, and just like selective service in the military, psychedelics are not for everyone. I've seen... Some people have some weird experiences on psychedelics and, uh, you know, uh, get caught in some strange fucking places. 
Um, yeah. So it's it's definitely not for everybody, and there's people who have different mental illnesses that that it's not for. Um, at the same time, mushrooms can be used to treat depression and and PTSD and things of that nature. Um, I wouldn't call Molly a psychedelic, but they are using uh, MDMA to or couples counseling, right? Right, couples counseling, and to treat the same things: depression, PTSD, uh, things of that nature. But um. It's all about intent, your, your intent when you're taking it. I mean, yeah, they could totally be taken for fun and, and to have, you know, a good time. Um, well, I mean. Uh, and it's, but it's about, it's about what you take away from the experience. If it is going to be a, a tool and something that you're using in that way, it's about what you take away from the experience. And, 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 but, but should it be something that is prescribed by a doctor? Or should it be a over-the-counter kind of drug? That you can use either recreationally or as needed. 100% I think that psychedelics could be medicine. And, and are medicine. Um, I mean, hey, if you want to call addiction a disease, I know that's an, another debate for another day. Um, and I'm sure everybody that's out there watching this podcast, is it's half and half. Um, but if you want to call addiction a disease, and for the sake of this argument, we'll say addiction is a disease. And psychedelics totally helped cure my disease and um i would love to see more people who have you know terrible alcoholism or sure. you know um smokers yeah smokers who have have addictions be prescribed psychedelics along with therapy and and such um you know what i mean because like i said once again it's it's not for everyone it's you know it have to be something that you have to vet people and gauge people to know if well, if it's for them additionally um, you're talking about like schedule one narcotic like uh i think lsd is a schedule one narcotic mm -hmm. right yeah and so like no real research can be done into that that kind of drug you know and so i think that because like uh marijuana has fallen down the list you know in yeah. uh in terms of um how people perceive it you know i think a lot more research has been done and that's why you got the cbd oils and stuff like that that people are using for a non-high relieving uh, effect that can uh cannabinoids have yeah all right and, and, you know, slowly mushrooms, like a psilocybin is coming down the list, whereas the people are using it with, uh, um, what is it, migraines, you know, stuff like that, and depression right. and stuff like that being treated with microdoses of psilocybin. And right. So I think that, you know, as, as soci our society progresses, maybe we'll start seeing, you know, a lot of these psychedelics come, come down the list in terms of, like, uh, how they're used. Right. You know, and as they come down the list, maybe they'll stop at a certain point and it's like, we shouldn't just sell this over the counter like you do with weed in certain cases. Right. Certain states. We shouldn't load Time magazine with uh, blotter sheets. <laughs> right. You know, instead of perfume, you know, just blotters. Yeah. Yeah. That'd it, be awesome. Different acid companies. Well, I mean, there's, there is, God. there is a danger to people who are tripping. Totally. You know, it's, there's. It's not for everyone. It's totally not for well, everyone. Well, I mean, the process of it is that you need to be in a controlled environment where there's somebody right. who is going to stop you from doing something stupid like jumping off a roof. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, <coughs> like Bill Hicks said, if you, if you thought you could fly, why didn't you take moron. off from the ground? <laughs> Start yeah. from the ground. Yeah. Um, and that is the typical story of, you know, people. Of, of the 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 story of the guy so, jumping yeah. out the hotel window, which yeah. is like hotel windows are made so that people can't, can't jump, jump out, out of them. them. Yeah. Like they're sick of all the suicides. I know, because um. <laughs> obvious reasons. And so, uh, but I I think that you know it should be regulated in such a way. Like for example, like um like cocaine used to be a medicine, right? But the way you get it these days, because uh, cocaine uses was, was in liquid form and it was very diluted. Uh, but when you're talking about cocaine the way it is on the streets in terms of like crack or even just powder cocaine, it is an incredible amount of that cocoa, that cocaine, you know, that you're delivering into your system. Right. And higher than, you know, than you, you really need. Right. And, and caffeine's the same way. It's like you can keep dosing and dosing on that. And then, you know, your tolerance go, goes down and stuff like that. I think that that's a dangerous drug. You know, that can uh, lead to, you know, wiping out your bank account, you know, selling all your possessions and stuff like that. It's the right. same thing with heroin. But you got to understand, it's like heroin was first developed as a painkiller. They're trying to come up with a better painkiller, and they come out with the most dangerous drugs, known, uh, one of the danger, most dangerous drugs known to man. Yeah. Which is, I don't know, it's, it's terrifying. If I were that scientist who was trying to develop a better painkiller and invented the most dangerous drug known to man, 
Isn't that like the worst feeling in the world? No shit. That's got to be the worst feeling. Well, except those guys that made Oxycontin, they fucking, they, I'm sure they love that feeling. Well, I think, I think they, they knew exactly what they were doing when it comes to opiates. It's like people know what opiates do. Yeah, and, totally. And I think that there's no psycho, psycho, uh, psychedelic value to mm-hmm. opiates. You know, there's nothing to be gained, you know, right. th- uh, through your spirit. Like uh, you said, it's like people will like, will take mushrooms once or they'll take acid once. And then they have a whole new perspective on their life. And then all of a sudden they drop something you never thought they'd drop. Right, yeah. right, yep. This, this guy wasn't showering every day. You know, he was like, all of, you know, he took one hit of acid one time. And next thing you know, he dropped 100 pounds and he's out, he's jogging every day. He right. Quit smoking yep. and stuff like that. And their entire life changes. And I think that that's a good thing for people yes. to experience. But right. also there are people who have like bad experiences on these things. And we don't know why one has a bad experience or not on like a bad quote unquote bad trip or something like that. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's good to do research on these things so that people can avoid these bad trips. Right. And it really can. has to do with your own personal psychology. They're, they're called psychedelics for a reason. And, and you know, everybody a- always asks how it's going to affect them. And there are definitely overlaps of how, you know, LSD or mushrooms are going to affect you. But, a lot of that depends on you and your personal experiences, your personal psychology and who you are as a human, what you've seen, heard, felt, learned o- over the course of your life um, is a lot of that determines and how to, how it's going to affect you. Well, how about ceremony like uh, peyote and ayahuasca? And it's like, these things are, are parts of ceremony. Sure. I'm um, totally for psychedelics for religious purposes. That's a, they're definitely a part of my, my dichotomy, but my, my religion, my theology, whatever you want to fucking call it, man. Um, you know, a lot of moonshiners back in the day were allowed, were operating under a license to brew like wine for, uh, <laughs> for religious reasons. Like religious there, purpose? Yeah. Cause there, there was a followers exemption. of Dionysus. Yeah. There was a, there was an exemption there for people who needed uh, alcohol for religious purposes okay. and stuff like that. So these people, a lot of these are moonshiners huh. and stuff like that. And so, um, yeah, I think that uh, yeah, if there's a ceremony involved in it, I think that you know that it's a lot it's a lot better. Like uh, I think you and I were talking about like ayahuasca is like there's a you have to lead up to it where you have to like be eating certain things, mm-hmm. you have to be meditating a certain amount mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And I think that that's probably a better thing because I mean I think that um, preparing yourself mm-hmm. physically for an experience like that can guide you into a better place. I think, or on better footing, right? You know, than just randomly being dosed by LSD. Because mm-hmm. I remember, um, I, I watched. I think it was some crime story where this guy broke into this lab where they're making LSD, and he was an undercover agent, and um, and they're making LSD in this lab, and he was had his grown out this beard as an undercover agent. And then they went and did the raid, and so he had to wear a gas mask to go in there, but he shaved, like dry shaved with a razor, so he can get the gas mask to seal over his mouth, uh-huh. over his face. But because he had all these open things, all these open pores and stuff like that from shaving, it's like he got so dosed with acid, with awesome. LSD. No, it's not awesome. I mean, it was like he came out and he had one pupil was like real big, dilated, and the other one was real tiny and stuff like that. That means psychological damage. That means neurological right. damage. Yeah. And so, I mean, when it comes to like, you can't overdose on uh, THC, but you can overdose on LSD. Right. right. There are also stories. And I can I can find the the paper and send it to you, but there are totally stories of people who have taken mega doses of LSD, um, and it's had profound effects on them. The similar effects that you've described. These people just have one simple trip where they you know give up the thing and start jogging, right? Where people have had these these mega doses and it's totally altered their life or you know. F- fixed some fucking psychological disorder or stutter or whatever. I'm sure you've heard Paul Stamets um, anecdote about, you know, being on mushrooms and climbing the tree and kind of eliminating his stutter during his mushroom trip. Uh, yeah, I remember something like that. So, um, yeah, I think once again, you know, it shouldn't be forced on everybody. It's not for everybody. For the people that it's for, it should be available to. Um, um, for citizens, not civilians. Fuck that. <laughs> Messing with so it. yeah, I'm I'm um the war on consciousness is a real thing, man. Um I had a so the last person that I actually had a psychedelic experience with is kind of new to the realm of psychedelics, asked me, 
So why is this illegal? And I fucking just lost it laughing, as you do when you're on a high dose of psychedelics. Oh, okay. But um, uh, it's it's illegal because it does. It, it it does help people to view the world in a different way and to free think and you know maybe pull you away from that TV and pay attention to to fucking real life, man. Um, and that's that's the best advice that I can give you just for life. Or if you're gonna use psychedelics, is have fun. You know, go into it with a with a good attitude. Have have fun. Pay attention and enjoy the trip. Now I say pay attention because you know there is no such thing as a bad trip. It's just trips you weren't ready for. You didn't pack your bags. Um, maybe you got too much baggage and you should leave some of it at the airport. Um, so pay attention to those things that are, you know, crawling around in your head and maybe bugging you when you're having that psychedelic experience, because maybe those are the things that you need to focus on or, or change or alter in your life. Um, for the price of one therapy session. Yeah, man. (laughs) Psychedelics can be very therapeutic, but they're not for everybody and, and they can be abused. You know, ex- excess exists. You well, know, three games of Call of Duty is great. Uh, eight hours of Call of Duty is bad. Yeah, unfortunately, there's no kind of regulation over things like that you do to yourself, like uh, right. uh, the dopamine, you know, that you can make, make yourself hit yourself with, whether it's right. through, like, I- extreme physical, physical exertion, mm-hmm. you know, through sex. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, like, all these dopamine hits. It's like the government can't really shouldn't regulate these kinds of things mm-hmm. in terms of... Uh, you know, but these are like adrenaline, like people who like, uh, you know, jump off of buildings and stuff like that. What's that called? Freebasing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they free what Richard Pryor did. They freebase and then jump off the building. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's a Tom Petty song or something. <laughs> and so, uh, <clears throat> like, I distracted myself. What were we talking about? Psychedelics. Yeah, I think more research needs to go into these kind of drugs because I totally. think, like I mentioned earlier, it's like because marijuana has fallen down the list in terms of like how dangerous people think it is and stuff like that. It's like we aren't in the 30s. It's not reefer madness anymore. Right. People are more reasonable about marijuana and that right. there are beneficial effects. And there's plenty of people who wouldn't smoke weed who use CBD oil right. and stuff like that. And so I think that if we had more research into things like uh, like LSD and like psilocybin and stuff like that, I think we're going to find more and more... Um, beneficial effects of these drugs and if we can separate um um the compounds that are good for analgesic properties like with the cbd oil which are the cannabinoids or the thc the thing that makes you high quote unquote you know it's like we could separate those components then you don't have to worry about the somebody freaking out it's like they smoked so much weed or ate an edible and they went all weird and stuff like that right you don't have to worry about that because you can target the desired effect on the desired uh you know affliction if you will no i you know, I think another thing that is uh, funny about psychedelics, too. An- another thing, too, about psychedelics, so we were talking about it in all these terms of, like, you know, in, this, in these intellectual terms and stuff like that. They could definitely just be used to have fun and, and fucking listen to some wompy music at a music festival or enjoy, you know, fucking Pink Floyd. It makes music sound phenomenal. Trust me. Um, music already sounds phenomenal. Music already does sound phenomenal. But if you take four hits of LSD and listen to Pink Floyd, it sounds a whole lot better. Uh, but anyway, what I was, uh, what I was about to get into, fuck, I lost my train of thought. I distracted myself. You want to move on? No, I, I want to remember the thing that I wanted to say. I feel like that it's, it's important. I'm waiting. Uh, I think a lot of people would be surprised. Um, I, 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 what it is, is another part of the problem with psychedelics is I think there's a strange connotation. I mean, not a strange one. There's a, there's a connotation that comes with, with psychedelics. It's that, a stigma. Yeah. Yeah. Stigma that comes that there's, um, either a, it's crazy people. You're going to go crazy, crazy hippie. It's going to make you a fucking communist hippie. Yeah. Um, or, it, you know, it you're, you're going to lose your mind <laughs> and go to the insane asylum. But I think that some people who are necessarily privy to, drug culture and and party culture in those terms would be surprised by the amount of their friends and coworkers who regularly use LSD and psychedelic mushrooms, DMT, things things. of that nature for consciousness exploration, psychedelic uh, or spiritual um, sustenance or, you know, for ceremonies and bonding with your friends. 
those, um, those functional who, hippies. Who are still very functional adults who don't live in sunrooms and own vans and do comedy and um, all that weird shit, are you, you know? Are you talking about somebody specific? No, no, okay. I'm not talking about any specific that's people. That's very, that's very specific you got. Um, and, I, and I mean, I, I think that's part of the reason why I like doing my podcast and this podcast and doing the serious podcast and, and especially talking about psychedelics and stuff is because like, yeah, a lot of people view me as this like silly guy who, you know, maybe can't be taken seriously and is fucking spun out on drugs, but I can definitely sit down and have a intellectual conversation with you about psychedelics or many other things. And there's a lot of other people out there like that too. It's just, you know, we're, we're not all fucking space cadets. Some of us are, but not all of us are. And even the ones who are space cadets, when you get them to focus long enough um, and they scratch that brain itch, they'll say some really profound things that'll that'll make you think. You know what I mean? Gives you a new perspective. Yeah. And that's the point, right? Man, and sometimes it's that fucking schizophrenic guy at 7-Eleven who's got a cat on a leash that says that weird riddle thing that just unlocks that mystery in your brain and you start seeing the universe in a new way. It's always that guy in every movie I've ever seen. It's didn't, that guy. Didn't Corn do that song, Cat on a Leash? Feeling like a cat on a leash. Yeah. Okay. Corn's actually my psych- favorite psychedelic band. You want to talk about this last subject? Sure. We got about fifteen minutes left. We got like fifteen minutes left to talk about Islam. Islam. Do you want to take it or shall I? I mean, um, sure. I'll, I'll lead it off. I let off the rest of the. I let off the rest of the podcast. So, um, so yeah. Here's how I feel about um, Islam, the Muslim faith, and is, Islamophobia. I feel that um, a lot of the Islamophobia has been indoctrinated on us for particular reasons. Um, by particular people, and um, there are some a, a, a percentage of Muslims, people of the Muslim faith, who are radical, um, violent, extreme, um, and do use brutal tactics to try and get across uh, their points and and uh, establish their God or, or their freedom or, or whatever it is that they see. And I'm not going to sit here and say that I agree with those organizations who do um, terrible, fucking horrifying things. Um, what I will say is that not all Muslims are those type of Muslims um, and that some people have misinterpreted the Quran, which is a beautiful poem. Um, just like some people have misinterpreted the Bible, like David Koresh, like Jim Jones, you know, like... Uh, you know, what's the cocksucker's name? Joel, Joel Osteen, you know, um, these people aren't there. They, that's the definition of using God's name in vain. You know what I mean? They're they're They profit off of God's name in a, an evil way. Um, and that's not right. So yes, yeah, just, it, just like, yeah. just like those people who have misinterpreted the Bible incorrectly. Um, Sure. There are people who have misinterpreted the Quran uh, incorrectly, and then there's fucking whole cultures and Sharia law and all sorts of shit and wars that have been fought over that. Um, and it, it is terrible and horrible and disgusting. Yeah. But about that's not all Muslims. Yeah, they've been fighting each other since yeah. six thirty. That's that's not all Muslims. Um, you know, not 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 all Muslims are you know uh, misogynists. Um, even though a, a large part of that faith is very uh, patriarchal, for lack of a better term. Um, but not all Muslims are that way. And I think that if you would sit down and talk to uh, people of the Muslim faith, particularly ones in, who live in this country, because those are the only ones I've ever talked to, um, that you'll come to find that they're not as harsh uh, or as aggressive as you might think. Um, well, sure. It's strange, too, because a lot of... The, an, another weird thing about Muslim faith and stuff, too, is um, they're, they are, they're, they're actually a very conservative um, yeah. and family-oriented, religious-oriented yeah. culture and people. They're um, very into family. Um, just like Hispanics. 
<laughs> so not, not quite like that, but okay. I, I, but in, in the same vein, as far as being family oriented and, and religiously oriented. Sure, you know but I mean? Hispanics don't marry their cousins. Okay. All right. Generally. Okay. I feel like this is a different. I feel like we've spun out a little bit. Not really. But that's okay. I just threw a fact out there, like in Muslim countries, like it's legal yeah. and often encouraged to marry your cousin. Right. But uh, Iran, just... Iran is like casterly rock, if you feel me. Okay. All right. Hey, maybe I didn't do enough of my research, and those aren't things that I agree with. Just like but, I don't agree with the people me... in the Appalachia who do that. You, you go ahead. You go ahead, Scott. I've said. I've said it. I think I got enough of a base out here. Okay. I mean, and you're right. You know, there is a a um. It, it, the idea of the American hillbilly in terms of, and you're talking about isolated popula- population, but I think we're talking about incest as a whole. You know, it's like, even if we're talking about Game of Thrones, you know, um, you could say is like the reason why, you know, you, incest pops up in Game of Thrones is because like you're trapped in a winter and it's nothing but your family around, you know, the line must go on and stuff like that. And when you're talking about regions of the world where it's main, mainly tribal and, you know, you're, around like everyone around you is your cousin and you got to marry somebody so i mean it's very common you know in uh, uh muslim countries that you know cousins marry and so you know you got a lot of birth defects and stuff like that right. in those nations because of it but when you're talking about islam it's like i was i wanted to look real quickly and see see if where the terrorism is in the five pillars of islam and i i couldn't find it all right and so the five pillars of islam are uh shahada which is the first the profession of faith and so that's basically like five times a day when you pray, and that's coming up, um, uh, you make a profession of your faith that you, you serve Allah and so forth. And, you know, it's like, I, I am a Muslim, basically. And it's like, so you remind yourself every day. And it's like, it's very common for people to remind themselves, whether it's a crucifix around your neck or touching something on the door when you come in the, in the house or whatever. There's something that, or, you know, don't eat uh, bacon and stuff like that. There's right, things right, right. that you do to remind you what your faith is or to profess your faith through the world. All right. The second pillar of Islam is Salat, which is a prayer, and that's five times a day. And it's like a dawn, you know, uh, uh, lunch, I think, and then there's three more times, you know, ending the day. So, I mean, it's basically five times a day you pray, and that's where you give your profession of faith and you have your prayer. Uh, the next one is Zakat, which is the almsgiving, which is about 2.5% of their income, which is way cheaper than Christianity, I'll tell you that. <laughs> All right. And so, um, Catholic Church could learn a thing or two. Absolutely. 10%? You out of your mind? It's, <laughs> it's 2.5% uh, for, the, for almsgiving. I think that's the minimum. And so, but people will, they'll do this and they'll do this to uh, like keep the mosques in upkeep. They'll do it for, you know, uh, the impoverished in their areas and stuff like that. It's very similar to tithing in Christian churches and so forth. Uh, the next pillar of Islam is Swam, S-A-W-M, which is fasting. And this is during Ramadan. It's part of their... Uh, religious practice is like uh, during the day, uh, during Ramadan, they do not eat. It's not till sundown. Right. It's like so from or drink water, or drink or smoke or anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like no intaking of anything. Right. Uh, I think they call that dry fasting these days. Man, there's actually uh, there's well, actually a few basketball players, at least one that I can think of right, right off the top of my head, who has uh, had to play in games, and, and he plays you know twenty minutes a game in basketball on Ramadan. With you know, with no water, no food, Ugh, and have not been be hydrated yeah. or, or nourished that day. He wakes up like four in the morning, just starts chugging water. I mean. Uh huh. I imagine so. Yeah. All right. So, um, and the fa- the last pillar of Islam is the Hajj, which is the pilgrimage, and it's like every every right, Islamic right, right. follower should go to um, to Mecca to Mecca, and uh, to see the pre-Islam black rock that they got there. They right. Got, they got a really interesting rock there that you know de- uh, predates. Islam, but you know, everyone thinks it's part of Islam now. And Which, so, if you, if sorry, if you want to hear a really interesting video, check out Malcolm X talking about his, uh, his Hajj, his Hajj, yep, when he came back from his Hajj. Um, and I think that I that's one of my favorite, uh, the pilgrimage idea is is really interesting to me in terms of uh, religion. It's because there's no, there's nothing like it in the Christianity that I grew up in. You know, where you have to go to the Holy Land or anything like that. There's right. No, there's nothing like that. They don't want you to go to the River Jordan. Right. And so, I mean, you know, be baptized in the River Jordan. Right. Like an arrogant, rich American. So, I mean, it's a, it's uh it's interesting because it kind of forces you to go back to the place. It's like, sure, I mean, if you, if you live in a small town outside of Mecca, it's no big deal to go on a hajj. You know, but if you live in the United States or something like that and you go on your hajj, that's got to be an experience from you, like to travel from the third, from the first world to the third world. 
in many ways. Or second world, let's be honest. Second world. All right. Not only is that, it's like, for example, like we were talking about military service earlier and how that made me a better person. And that was like me traveling the world. It's like I got to see other places in the world, and that's good for you. I think that's a good learning experience all on its own. And sure, the religious uh, aspect of it, that helps as well and so forth. And like it leads you, it's like, oh, this is all part of my religious uh, experience. And even growing up as a, as a young kid, because a lot of people will do their hodge early. They'll get it out of the way because they have to do it once in a lifetime. He's like, you know, I don't want to get hit by a bus and walk funny when I'm 43 or something like that. And it's going to be way harder to do the hodge. So a lot of people will do it when they're young, which makes sense to me. And when I was young, you know, I did a lot of like mission trips and stuff with my church is like uh, building houses for the uh, homeless and stuff like that. You know, and I thought that that was kind of the age where you should be doing something like that. You should go out and meet like uh, all the people in the world, you know, and, you know, and uh, center your faith based upon that. You know, I get that. But I'll tell you what, of those five pillar of, pillars of Islam, I see nothing about terrorism. Nothing about killing the infidel. Right. And when you're talking about Islamophobia, it's like, I don't see that. I don't see that in Islam. It's like, it seems very normal and, chari and charitable, you know, with even less of a tithe that you have to give. So, I mean, it's, I don't see anything that is profoundly wrong with the faith. However, I think the problem with um, Islam is the culture surrounding it. You know, Islamic countries, they did not have a renaissance. They did not have an age of enlightenment in the way that the Western cultures had with their Christianity. You know, where they started saying, it's like, hey, let's listen to more of what Jesus said instead of all this fire and brimstone stuff in the, in the Old Testament and stuff like that. You know, and, it's like, and there's plenty of verses in the Bible that say, put the unbelievers to the sword. You know, and there's plenty of verses that can be interpreted that way. And, the, and uh, you know, <clears throat> do not suffer a witch to live. You know, they're telling people, like, kill unbelievers. And so it's like, but we kind of ignore them because we had a renaissance and we, we had this and, uh, new awakening, of the new covenant with Christ and so forth, where we're not going to sit there and we're not going to you know, put people to the sword who don't convert or die. However, there are texts within the Quran that help reinforce these ideas within the culture of Islam. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do understand what you're saying. I do understand what you're saying. And like you said, like, you, like the examples that you gave, there are definitely things from the Bible that can be misinterpreted or that evil men can take and capitalize off and use to further their narrative. Um, and I think a big part of the problem with, with um, the way that the Muslim faith is perceived and, and that these other countries are perceived is that um, <clears throat> these people, they do do horrible things. You know what I mean? They, they, they have done some horrible things. Um, but I think that, I think that there, a lot of these organizations are kind of hiding behind the mask of of Islam and of the Muslim faith, Absolutely. and that they're using those verses as a as a means to fit their narrative and enforce the things that they already want to do. Well, um, for their shit. own selfish benefit, yeah. and then they go like around the, destroying fucking Constantinople and stuff like that. Well, let's talk about a Hajj. You know, Christianity, modern Christianity, after the Renaissance did not have a hodge anymore. You know, people weren't going to the Holy Land. And the whole right. crusades, the entire crusades that the Islamists are so pissed off about to this day, is that, you know, the, the crusaders, the Knights Templar, were a force to help protect pilgrims on their way to Israel, which was at, held at that time being held by the, what are now the Palestinians, I believe. Right. And so... They were constantly being besieged by, by robbers and, and you know, uh, uh, people who people are told to kill Christians on sight and so forth. Right. You know, so that's what this, all, the, all this came from. You know, the, the experience of, uh, of the Middle Ages in Europe dealing with the quote-unquote Holy Land has resulted in a renaissance, had resulted in a renaissance where it's like, hey, we're not going to take it that seriously, are we? Like, for example... All the people who came to the, uh, the United States, who started this, this um, amazing American experiment here in the United States of America, lots of them, a great majority of them were Christians. Great majority of them were Christians. But when they came here, they started a government that had an unspoken 
separation between church and state. Okay? And so the idea was that, you know, here's, here's the metaphor that I've been working on. So say all these people came to the United States, and instead of setting up a, a, a de facto separation between church and state, we became a theocracy. A theocracy that based its laws on religion, the Christian religion. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have people trying to make laws in our Congress, you know, in the House of Representatives saying, it's like, look, it says, do not suffer a witch to live. But and that it, does happen to a certain extent, man. I mean, that, that, sure, that definitely bit, does happen. In but our... it hasn't happened to the extent that it has happened right. in, in Muslim-controlled theocracies. Right, right. And those Muslim-controlled theocracies, you know, they, um, they will enforce all those little tiny laws, like chopping off your hand mm -hmm, and stuff mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. Stuff that we find draconian today because we had a renaissance. Right, right, right. And so forth. But if we had some, if we had the United States set up under a theocratic ideals, we'd have you know people like homosexuals. No way, no way would they have ever gotten rights in this country under a, a, a religious theocracy, a Christian theocracy in this government. Right. And there's no way, you know, um, uh, uh, what are the, like African Americans would ever be sl freed as slaves. Did we just crash? I don't think so. No, okay, the screensaver popped up. All right. <laughs> And so, I mean, they would never be slave uh, because people would like literally interpret the laws of the text and say, see, it's okay to own slaves because we're talking about it in the Bible. Right. But we were not a religious theocracy here in this, co in the, in this country. Right. We have a de facto separation bet right. between church and state. And so when you have these countries who, like, who live and die by their quote unquote holy texts, and you know, you want to cite. Like, I don't like homosexuals myself, so I'm going to cite this quote out of context right. to further my goals. Right. And that happens a lot. Absolutely. And the entire movie of the Book of Eli is about that concept. Right. Gary Oldman's character, the way he saw the Bible that Eli was carrying was as a weapon. Yes. And that's the whole point of that movie is that because he was carrying it because he believe, believed in the message of the Bible. You know, that's why he was carrying it to this library in San Francisco. Why? I don't know. But he runs across Alcatraz. this... Right. He runs across this Gary Oldman character who saw that as a weapon. Right. Aimed, quote, in, quote, aimed directly at the hearts and minds of all of humanity. Yep. You know? And that is what malicious people do with a pure message. Mm -hmm. That is what people do. Pe humanity mm -hmm. fucks shit up. That's the only yep. thing we really do well. Yep. Even a pure concept, even the idea of perfect love, mm -hmm. we screw that yep. up. And, uh, you know... um, I want to get back to that thing you were talking about, um, the, the theocracy. Because um, although we don't technically live in a theocracy, there are still a lot of, you know, it's, it's very much a, a blanketed uh, theocracy. You know, it's an it's a in, in God we trust, you know, which is the... It's a, like I said, de facto which is separation. definitely supposed to be aimed at, you know, the, the Christian God. And the, I don't know if you've ever watched the Netflix docuseries, The Family, but I highly recommend everybody go watch that. It's about what they refer to as the Christian mafia. Um, and it's, it's these big corporate Christians. Um, it, it, they're, they're almost like a fucking Jesus cult, man. Um, and sure. a lot of the things that, that it, it's an Illuminati, you know, it's, it's a, it's a people of, it's, it's a group of businessmen, um, who are, who get together behind the scenes and use their, their spirituality and their, their networks and their connections and their resources to help better each other's goals. Um, and they're plugged the fuck in, you know, that's who's doing the national prayer breakfast. Um, and they're in a lot of politicians pockets. And then you see a lot of these, not that there's, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm not saying this because I innately agree with fucking democratic politicians. Cause a lot of democratic governors and politicians have done a lot of bullshit with this country. Um, and their different geographies since um, FDR, they've been helped. And, and, and a lot of those <laughs> ones are, are the ones who are, you know, um, they're the ones that are going to lead us into fucking agenda 2030 and uh, believe in these sustainable uh, societies are going to make us like fucking China. But I don't want to get into that too much because um, I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist. Too late. <laughs> too late a little bit. So, um, so yeah, there there is a little bit of a theocracy in this country. There are definitely laws that are made and, and wars that are fought and military funding that is going to Israel because that's the holy land where Jesus is supposed to come back. And we got to fucking make sure they don't build or make I, sure they do build the third simple attack. Temple of Solomon and no and and this this shit no. there there is shit that is 
that happens and is and does I, and I it's in the name of religion. It's, it's you know, it's it's the fucking people who said you know Trump is the second coming of Christ. That stupid who the radio hell said host. That it sure as hell wasn't me. Fucking idiot radio. It wasn't you. Um, Just because it was said doesn't mean it's the ideas of every Christian in this country. Right. Okay. And same as that's how and, conspiracy theories form. Man. Right. It's like and you're taking same, one thing and like applying it to all the people. Anyone who has any sense stays away from people like Joel, Joel Olstein. Any right. Christian with any sense stays away from these mega right. churches. Well, right? just like any Muslim with any good sense is, is staying stays away a- from those, those elite. Those, right. Uh, exactly. Those hard, hard liners. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So, uh, and, it, and, and I'm, that's yeah. why I brought up the, pi- the five pillars of Islam is because I want to tell you, it's like there's, of the five pillars, there's nothing in there that says kill the infidel. Right. It's just probably one small light I- line item, just like it is in like Leviticus in the Bible. Uh-huh. You know, it's just one small light I- line item that right. they want to make a policy on, a governmental right. policy upon. Right. And you can't do that. And Whether even though, even weird... if you want to think that mm-hmm. uh, America is highly influenced by Christianity, you know, to, a, to an alarmingly conspirator, conspirator kind of level, Fine. Think about that all you will, but there's right. no there's no laws on the books. It's like there, right. Congress shall make no no law respecting an establishment of a religion, and that's the point. It's like this the the, the separation of church and state is kind of real. It's it's unspoken. It's de, it's de facto, and I think that the, even though the Christians in those positions, and that influences their decisions, that makes them better people. Plus, they're not right. inbred. No, and I mean, I look the the people. The people in this country who are typically associated with the Christian values Repu- the party is the Republicans and the conservatives. And and those are the people who are trying to, like, make it – keep it so that I can go buy a fucking plot of land out in the mountains and, and, and live on a homestead. And you know what I mean? And, and Get away from all those other people. Keep government the fuck out of my, my pockets. And, Even and, them. And out of my yard <laughs> and out of my rainwater. You know what I'm saying? Um and and, yeah. and keep agenda twenty thirty out of my backyard, so um, it, it's just that's why it's hard being a free thinker and, and looking at these at, at issues, you know, subject by subject because it's like, well, I agree with this ideology when it comes to this topic, and I you know I agree with you know I agree I I'm conservative when it comes to guns, and I'm progressive when it comes to drugs, you know. So, uh, and, and everybody expects you, or at least a, a large portion of society expects you to either fit in their box or, and if you don't fit in their box, which is usually far left or far right, then, then you're their fucking enemy. Um, and I think that's a big problem that we're fucking yeah, having. Yeah, people now. don't fit in boxes yeah. unless you chop them up real fine, literally. Right. Um, the last thing that I will say about the Muslim faith and, and everything is, um, you know, Allah and God, and Yahweh, and the Tao, and the Brahma, and whatever the fuck you want to call it, the all-source, the infinite source. All-spark. The the all-spark of the universe. I really genuinely believe it's all the same thing. It's that same, that universal source, that creative energy that flows through all of us. Um, It's just that language is restricting, and language differs not just in the different languages, but in different geographies, people speak in different dialects in different ways. And, and then, you know, God and the universe gets interpreted in these different ways. And then humans selfishly and arrogantly try to apply their human traits and emotions onto God because we're narcissists. And well, now my narcissism doesn't agree with your narcissism, um, and, and, and we're fighting holy wars for all of eternity because your portrayal of God doesn't match my portrayal, and, and you know I've interpreted my God differently than you've interpreted your God, and it's all fucking ego. It's all, it's, it's all like an advanced form of narcissism. It's people trying to place their their values and their... And re- reflect who they are and their emotions and their traits onto something that you could never describe, something that is beyond words. Uh, yeah. So, yep. I respectfully disagree. Okay. You, so, so you believe in um, multiple gods, like like no, Indian no. culture? I believe in one god, Jesus and his father. Oh wait, maybe it's three gods. 
See, but here's the thing about Jesus and his father is... I think God came to earth as Jesus. I think it's all one being. Well, I think that... I think that Jesus tapped into what is known as cosmic or Christ consciousness um, and that he had a mystical experience and realized that he is God, that he is an extension of God. He is the son of God, just like you or I, just like we all are. And um, he said it um, yeah, and, the, and the language sure. which he had to say it in was fucking Hebrew. Um, and, you know, not everybody wanted to interpret that correctly. Um, so, and, and, I definitely believe that Jesus was a if if Jesus was real and Jesus is a, really a person and not just an allegory for cosmic consciousness, and you know if Jesus is really meant to be a story that's actually supposed to be you, um, then he was a man, he was a mystic, um, and he was tapped into divine grace, um, sure, and and that yeah he he he, he said it. You know what I mean, and and people didn't, and he he backed it up. Um, so um, as you see, Scott's floundering here. We've come about to the end of our show because he clearly lost this one. I think I won that one no, too. No, I think you lost this entire. I think I won all of them. Entire episode. You now. even agreed with me on the whole Muslim thing. You said that not yeah. all Muslims are bad too. Sure, that's I mean because that's obvious. That's okay. obvious. All right. So uh, just if you disagree with any of us, go down in the comments. Be sure to comment who you thought won. It's obviously the madman, this guy. You can find me on Shock Monkey Radio. And Scott over there, he has his own show too. This is not a Scott cast. I'm on Spotify now, bitch. Yeah, I, 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 my Shock Monkey Radio is available wherever you get your podcasts. Please go over to patreon.com slash Shock Monkey Radio. I'd appreciate it. You can also cash at me by using hashtag Shock Monkey Radio, all one word. Yep, you can cash at me with that money sign. Enjoy the trip. Pretty good. I'm just going to wait for this thing to go over. That's fine. Do the thing. thing. I got to pee so badly. That's good.